This episode contains adult language and topics that may be disturbing for some listeners. Such topics include suicide, drug use, physical or sexual abuse of a child. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Grant. And I'm Erica. And this is From From Crime Crime to to Crime. Crime. Welcome back to From Crime to Crime, Season 3, Episode 1. Can you believe we've made it this far? Yeah, I'm excited to be back. I know, me too. We took a longer break than we thought we would. We didn't get as much done as we thought we would either, but we took a longer break, so (laughs) we're rested and rejuvenated. We're ready to tackle these true crime cases. These true crime capers. Yes, we are. Can we call them capers? True crime capers. I mean, doesn't capers mean like stealing? Like stole something? I don't know. I know it's like a little salty ball that goes in some food sometimes. I like those capers as well, but true crime capers. That would have been a good true crime name. We should have come up with that instead of from crime to crime. True crime capers. (laughs) Okay. I know we've been off for a while, but get back on track here, kid. Sorry. I'm just, I'm just so excited. I'm just so excited to have a microphone in my face and just talk to a crim criminologist. Welcome back, criminologist. That's already a fan base name. Oh, all right. We got to come up with something. Okay. So let's get into this episode because Samuel Little is a big one. Like this episode could end up being very long. (laughs) Yeah, it really could. But I mean, how could it not? Like this dude is America's most prolific serial killer, you know, like it's right up my alley, obviously. Like we've done tons of research into this. We know a lot about this. So I've been really excited to record this one for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get started. So we're going to be talking about Samuel Little and like Grant Spoiler alerted, he is America's most prolific serial killer, which I guess everybody knows that. (laughs) Oh, I don't know. Maybe not everyone does it. If you don't know, it means he has the most victims. Yeah. Samuel Little was born in Georgia in 1940, and he says his mom was a sex worker and that he was sent to live with his grandma in Ohio, but he kind of had a lot of stories, so... Yeah, he did. He also said that he was born into jail, and that's kind of how he did with the grandma, but I think that one's probably the more likely scenario, too, from everything that I saw, was he was more likely yeah. probably born in jail and then reunited rather than on the side of the road and connected that way. Right. Yeah, there was all kinds of stories about him being abandoned on the side of the road and everything, but I think you're right the jail thing seems the most likely yeah so samuel has said that when he was in elementary school he started fantasizing like having sexual fantasies about women's necks and his teachers specifically you know and other classmates like when they would touch their necks it would excite him yeah i I remember him talking a lot about that he even said that one of the girls kind of knew that about him and she would kind of go out of her way to touch her neck in front of him and it just it just drove him crazy but his teacher did a lot too obviously not intentionally but i think that's probably where it even started was his teacher would would touch her neck a lot when she when she spoke yeah so how old though in elementary school was he he has said as young as five or seven. Oh wow yeah that's very young too, too young. young yeah yeah so by middle school he was screwing up pretty bad He was getting into trouble. He was just like not a good student. And in 1956, when he was like 15 or 16, he was locked up and held for the first time, like for a long period of time in a juvenile prison. What did he do? Breaking and entering. So he was robbing things. Yeah. Start him young, huh? Although. He was capering. So (laughs) (laughs) He goes great in a pasta dish. Yeah. So by 1961, he was convicted of burglary for real because by that time he was an adult and he served three years on that charge. That's it? Just three years? I mean, that doesn't seem very long at at that age. Yeah, but it was his first adult offense, so I would imagine. I don't know. We'll we'll get into that because his luck with light sentences and being released for things that you really shouldn't be gets crazier and crazier as we go. That's like nothing compared to some of the stuff that he gets away with. So by the mid to late 60s, he had moved down to Florida to live with his mom. Oh, so they reconnected. Yeah, it seems like it right around this time. So while he's down in Florida living with his mom, he gets a job as a cemetery worker, which is like on point, (laughs) like like, like practice or, you know, like he's learning. Like, that's kind of weird. Yeah, it's kind of awkward. So this is when Samuel says he started to travel around more and more and got real into trouble with the law. 
He was in and out of jail and prison for all kinds of crimes. DUI, robbery, rape, fraud, solicitation, shoplifting, you know, just like being a general asshole. Yeah, sounds like it. Yep. Now, according to Little, he also took up boxing while he was doing time, and he speaks pretty highly of himself and his boxing skills. He even calls himself a prize fighter. From fighting and... In jail? <laughs> what was the prize? I don't know. Soups? I think you got Coffee? T- two, two desserts? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so in 1982, when he was 42 years old, Samuel was arrested in Mississippi for his first murder. 22-year-old Melinda Rose Laprise skeletal remains were found in a cemetery in Mississippi. Melinda was an exceptional musician, and she had a pretty loving family and siblings and all that, but after losing her mom at a young age, she got in with kind of a shitty crowd, and she ended up running away with a boyfriend and getting involved in drugs and sex work. Uh, Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so witnesses came forward saying they saw Melinda last getting into a brown station wagon with a man that looked just like Little. But then other witnesses came forward and said she was dropped back off by Little. So the jury kind of didn't know who to believe on the witnesses. Like, oh, maybe this guy just picked her up and then dropped her back off and then something else happened to her. So the case was presented to a grand jury, but they failed to return an indictment and he was released. Just able to go walking around everywhere again? Kind of. He got away with this one, but he was extradited to Florida during this whole thing to face another murder charge for a woman named Patricia Ann Mount, who was 26 when her body was found. And witnesses at this trial testified that Little was seen dancing with Patricia the night she was murdered and was seen leaving with him in his station wagon. And one of her hairs was found on his clothing. So eyewitnesses and hair analysis. Yeah, but they were dancing together. I mean, that could easily happen. I mean, (laughs) people shed very easily. You know, hair just falls out. So... You know, that's right. Obviously very circumstantial. Yep. And that was pretty much his defense on that one. And hair and eyewitnesses are like the two least reliable sources of evidence in a trial. So that's yeah. kind of sucky. But after a very short trial and deliberations, the jury acquitted him on this murder charge. See, and that's really interesting that they acquitted him because the place that they are, <laughs> Mississippi, at this time. This is in, in Florida. Oh, this one's in Florida? Oh, never mind. The first one was in Mississippi. Then he was extradited to Florida. But the I know where you're going with that, and it still yeah. stands. It's a black man in the South. Yeah. Like, it is you, interesting that he got away with both of these. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, obviously he shouldn't have, but we've seen a lot of unfair verdicts placed upon people of color in the South, especially during these times. So it's just, it's very unheard of and probably really unlikely for someone like this to have gotten away with it. Yeah, so at this point, Little thinks his shit doesn't stink because he's gotten away with assaulting and raping quite a few women by this point and now literally has gotten away with murder twice. Which is crazy. Like, that's just crazy talk. Yeah, totally. So when he's released, he heads west to sunny San Diego, California. So shortly after getting to California, he attacks and strangles a 22-year-old named Lori Barros. But Lori's kind of a badass and survives this attack. She's almost killed, but she's still capable of describing Little and his vehicle to police. So they're like on the lookout, you know, they're like, ooh, this is not good. Because she was able to describe down to like the furry dice he had hanging from the rearview mirror. Like she described his car in detail. Furry dice, man. That's very that's very 70s. Yeah. So about a month later, he picks up another woman named Tanya Jackson and heads to pretty much the same spot that he thought he had killed Lori. And the police in San Diego are being pretty thorough and proactive, kind of. And they're checking that spot that Lori was attacked like on a regular basis. You know, to see if there's any cars there or anything like that. And so when they get there, they see a car and it matches the description of the one that Lori Barros described. So they stop. And when they get out, Little got out of the car and started walking towards the cop car. And his neck was all scratched up and bloody. And he gave them some ridiculous story about getting in a fight with his wife And now they're making up in the car. So the cops check on the woman in the car and she not only is not his wife, she is naked and unconscious. Mm, That's not great. Nope. So he's caught red handed. But 
Tanya survives. The police were able to get to her in time, and she survives this attack. So they arrest him, and both women are able to identify him and testify at trial. But there's a few hiccups with their testimony. Lori had told the police and investigators that she was kidnapped and raped, but it later came out at the trial that she was a sex worker and went with him willingly. And, like, I get it. I mean, I get it. You know, it shouldn't that, matter. It shouldn't matter. Like that, that's why she was with him. Like you know, what he was doing was still so far past. Right, but it just kind of showed like a history of not telling the truth. So then Samuel Little's attorneys kind of pounced on that and were like, "Well, is she even telling the truth about this attack?" It just made a doubt in right. people's mind. Yeah. So it's not very credible at that point in right. in the jury's eyes. Right. But they still had the other woman, Tanya Jackson. Now, her testimony went a little awry because she showed up slightly drunk to court. Uh, well, you know, pff, kind of fair, <laughs> you know. They're having yeah. her relive some of these really dark, awful things and in front of the guy who did it. So, yeah. though I understand you shouldn't show up to court drunk, like... When, I also uh, get wanting to uh, have a couple of drinks. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, get I get it a little totally. bit, you know. Totally. Not saying it's right, but I get it. Yeah. So another issue that they had in this trial was a woman named Aurelia Jean Dorsey also testified. She was Samuel Little's girlfriend, but she was like 30 years older than him. They had met in the 70s in jail, like in Ohio. Yeah. She had overheard his girlfriend at the time saying she was going to testify against him. And she didn't know him or anything, but this prison was like old and decrepit where they could like talk to each other through the walls and stuff and like through the pipes <laughs> and so she warned samuel little about the girlfriend's testimony before he went to trial why so he ended up getting i that i cannot understand why yeah i i don't understand either and why would you give him a heads up like he's not a good dude you don't even know him right and that's the other thing too you don't even know him like why yeah. would you give him a heads up and how did you give him a heads up? Because I would assume even then men and women were separated, but I know he could talk through pipes, but yeah. yeah. And apparently that's how they did it. So when he got off on this charge because he knew what testimony was coming and all that stuff, he was like very impressed by Gene Dorsey and was like, wow, that was really like loyal. And like it kind of like made him like her, you know, I don't know. They had this like weird connection. Yeah, it was really more of like a mother son connection, though, because like you said, she was like 30 years older than him. And, yeah. you know, as we learn more about Jean and like kind of her involvement, like it doesn't scream like a very sexual relationship at, in no. my eyes. No, it seems like she was really good at stealing stuff and fencing items. And Samuel was a strong, big man. And they were both living this like kind of transient lifestyle. So it almost seems like. They helped each other in a way, like survive. Like that, he yeah. protected her, and she stole things and made them money. But it didn't seem very sexual because he was very clear that he was sexually active with other women. Right, ab absolutely. And you know, she cleaned up after him a lot. And so you know, it really does seem more of like a mother son relationship than it does like a partner relationship. But I guess, for lack of a better word, it's a boyfriend girlfriend thing. Right. So Jean Dorsey was a master manipulator and she testified in this trial and came across very credible because she was well spoken. She dressed nice. At this point, the police caught him red handed. So it really shouldn't matter whether the witnesses weren't credible and Jean Dorsey was and all that stuff. It really shouldn't matter because they caught him red handed. But because totally. the jury didn't find the witnesses credible, the verdict came back with a hung jury. When this happens, they have to start over and do the whole trial and everything again. And the prosecutor decided not to move forward with another trial and instead offered Little a plea deal. The plea deal was that he would plead to assault and false imprisonment charges and pick up a four-year sentence. And he accepted it, so... Four years for trying to kill two women. That's crazy. But I, I assume, too, that prison almost is like a break for him, you know, because he doesn't have to live that transient lifestyle anymore. He gets kind of to relax and have three hot meals and place to sleep every night. Well, and he's a prize fighter. 
Well, and he's a prize fighter too. <laughs> so yeah, if any, you know, so I, I guess he could uh, earn extra commissary that way. Yeah. So four years for trying to kill two women is again another lucky break. Like he just gets break after break after break, and another one comes because this four year sentence is in California. So he was out in two years instead of four. So he served two years for almost killing two women. And he thought he killed Lori. Yeah. Like she survived just by sheer badassery. (laughs) Yeah. Like he left her to die. Exactly. So by this time he's released and it's February of 87 and he heads to Los Angeles, California. By the time he gets to L.A., Almost immediately, bodies of women start turning up. In 87, a lady named Carol Alford was found in an alley. And then in 88, Jean Dorsey, his girlfriend, also dies in Los Angeles of a brain hemorrhage. Were they together, like, when that happened? They traveled together from 1971 until she died in 88. Okay, so he... Probably took her to the hospital and, you know, tried to get her all fixed up and stuff. She wasn't murdered. She died of a brain hemorrhage. No, I know that. I just, I didn't know if he was like right there and like, you know, got her to the hospital and stuff, which is amazing. Like it shows that he really did care about her because he tried to have her get help versus other people where he just killed them. So. So in 89, Audrey Nelson's body is found in a dumpster in downtown L.A. And then later on in September of 89, Guadalupe Apodaca was found in an abandoned parking structure in South L.A. So the police hadn't connected these murders together or to Little. They were just noticing that bodies of women were popping up everywhere. They didn't even, he wasn't even on anybody's radar yet. Yeah, but all these murders happened really close together. There wasn't like any kind of connection to that. Yeah, because it was the 80s. In L.A., bodies were popping up everywhere. It was the crack epidemic and violent crime was super high back then. They did not connect these three murders together just based on what they found because there was a lot of other murders that had popped up in between them. So it wasn't like these were the only three murders and they were right by each other and they're like, this has to be a serial killer. Right. There was a ton of murders. There was a ton of drug overdoses. There was, you know, it was a lot of stuff going on. Well, and this is like Richard Ramirez time. This is um, Golden State Killer, Night Stalker. You know, so yeah, this is the golden age for serial killers. So Well, and it's California. Which is right. the golden area for serial killers. It's because it's always nice out. Yeah. You think that's why? I think so, yeah. Because there's nothing, it's never really too hot and especially not too cold. So, yeah, I think so. I think the weather has a ton to do with it. Interesting. I never thought about that. The other thing is all the jurisdictions in L.A. Like, just because Audrey Nelson was found in downtown L.A. and Guadalupe Apodaca was found in South L.A., like those are, I'm sure, two different police departments. Yeah, and I, I think that probably muddies the waters. So, they hadn't connected them together or to Little, but by 1990, Little started drifting all around the U.S. again, and since he's a piece of shit who doesn't work or have any kind of, like, <laughs> financial trail, like filing his taxes or paying a mortgage, the only confirmation of where he was over the next 16 years are his arrest records that's incredible that's yeah. just so nuts that that's how they find him like man he was yeah. transient you know he yeah had nothing to his name so yeah that's how they yep. found out where he was but he also used several different names too yes samuel mcdowell samuel little i'm sure he went by other names that they don't even know about Yeah, I'm sure. So what we do know because of his arrest record is from 1990 to 2006, so 16 years, he was arrested in at least seven states for everything from DUI, theft, burglary, larceny, shoplifting, solicitation, etc. He's an asshole. He's a total dickhead. (laughs) But by 2007, we know he's back in Los Angeles because he's arrested in May of 2007 and charged with possession of cocaine. Because he didn't get the memo that it wasn't the 80s anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Time to put the cocaine down. Yeah. So instead of jail, though, he's sentenced to drug court, like a drug diversion program. And obviously Little isn't going to drug diversion classes. (laughs) No. That's not too surprising. No, he's literally gotten away with murder like a bunch of times. He's not going to become a rule follower all of a sudden. Like, could you imagine him showing up like on Tuesdays and Thursdays at three o'clock for his drug diversion class? He's not going. It'd be pretty wild of all the things if that's what he showed up for. I know. But because he doesn't show up, L.A. issues a bench warrant for his arrest. But because it's a nonviolent offense, it's not extraditable. So over the next five years, he's arrested a bunch and come in contact with police a bunch all over the country for stuff that, you know, some of it minor, some of it a little major. But they can't bring him back to L.A. because 
the warrant is non-extraditable, so they just keep catching him and releasing him. So in April of 2012, LAPD detective Mitzi Roberts runs the DNA from the Audrey Nelson case and the Guadalupe Apodaca case, and it hits on Samuel Little, whose DNA was in the system because of the attacks on the two women in San Diego. That makes sense. You know, I mean, same style and, and all that kind of stuff and, you know, same manner of what he's doing, same victimology, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this seems like it lines up real well. Right. So she starts trying to find him because this guy's all over the map. This is 2012, and these murders took place in the late 80s. So she's working on cold cases trying to get DNA hits. And this guy pops, and she's like, oh, my gosh. So she eventually tracks him down, six months later, from an ATM transaction from a prepaid debit card that he used to cash his Social Security checks. How does he get Social Security? I know. That's what I was thinking. Like, how is this guy collecting on anything? He didn't pay into anything. That's what I didn't. I know he worked odd jobs throughout the years, but I thought you had to, like, severely pay into Social Security to collect from it. Like, it's not severely. Just... It's not severely, but it's something along the lines of, like, I don't know, a certain amount of months, but it's not severely. Interesting. Well, either way, his car was used at a liquor store in Louisville, Kentucky. They zero in on Louisville and eventually find him at a homeless shelter a couple of blocks from the liquor store. That's incredible. Like that they were able to find him off of this kind of info and track him down and find out where he was. Like he's an old man at this point. Like, yeah, no wonder they could catch him. I guess he was he was slowing down. Yep. So he's brought back to L.A. because they finally made that warrant extraditable when they realized he was a serial killer. And he's sentenced to three years on his cocaine warrant. So let that sink in. Yeah. He got more time for cocaine than he did for his murders. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But while they're getting ready to try him for the murders of Nelson and Apodaca... His DNA also hits on Carol Alford. She had been found in 87, right after he had moved to California. So now he's been connected to three murders of three different women in L.A. from the late 80s. So in January of 2013, they charge him with those three counts of murder, and he pleads not guilty. He puts on this huge spectacle. It's a total nightmare. And in September of 2014, he goes to trial. And this time, all the women that he's attacked over the years that were lucky enough to survive came forward and testified. How many of them were there? There was a lot. I, I couldn't nail down an, an exact number, but there was quite a few. This That's so telling because he killed a lot, too. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean. Yeah. Well, plus the investigators from these other states that had tried to nail him before, they also come forward and testify that they knew he was a serial killer and they just couldn't stop him. Like they could never prove it. Right. So these statements, plus obviously the DNA, finally nails Samuel Little. He's convicted of murder and sentenced to life without parole. Finally. I mean, you know, like. Yeah. So after his conviction, he was suspected in quite a few more murders across the U.S. because a crime analyst and a forensic expert from VICAP were starting to put the pieces together. But. He claimed he was innocent of the three that he was convicted of and didn't admit to any others. He was like, I'm innocent. This is ridiculous. And he was convinced he was going to beat these charges on appeal. Why wouldn't he? He's gotten away with murder before. Yeah, plenty of times. Yeah. So by May of 2018, all of his appeals were exhausted and he was having some pretty severe health issues. So he realized he was done. He was gonna die in prison there was no way he was gonna get out i would think to at least a degree this is probably something he's wanted you know he's been on the run for a long time really struggling for a long time and again prison is probably easier for him yeah maybe especially at this age although i was gonna say although in your 70s i doubt he's a prize fighter anymore so i don't know how he's getting soups yeah but (laughs) well yeah i doubt he's that but you know at that age too people tend to leave the older people alone so yeah Well, this is about the time that a Texas ranger named James Holland, who is an expert in interviewing assholes, started suspecting him in a Texas homicide. 
And he went to L.A. to interview Samuel Little. And he got Little to trust him. And he started interviewing him a lot and started to build like kind of a rapport with him. Samuel finally started breaking down and giving details on other murders to this Texas Ranger, James Holland. Finally, somebody was able to crack him. I mean, I think that's the biggest takeaway of this is as awful as he is and has been, at least he was willing to talk to somebody. And at least this Texas Ranger is able to peel back those layers and get a lot of info out of him so that we can learn a lot about not just what he's done, but how the serial killer mind works. Yeah. Do you have any insight on why you think he decided all of a sudden to just start confessing other than i think he knew that he was you know kind of on his last legs and i think he wanted to make a name for himself that's probably about it and he was getting stuff from the texas ranger as well so i mean there was there was some benefit for him too it's not like you know he was just giving this info up willingly he was but he was also given things too special treatment right yeah this is may of 2018 which is Exactly when they identified the Golden State Killer. Oh. And the Golden State Killer was getting a ton of media coverage, especially in California, where Samuel Little was. And I think he got to the end of his appeals. He knew he was going to die in prison. And he was like, hey, I'm, I don't know, in his own weird way, I think he was like, I'm better than that guy. Like, how come I'm not getting famous for this? I really think that had something to do with it. (laughs) I mean... To you and me and probably everybody else listening, that sounds really strange, but I guess when you're this far down this rabbit hole, if you're going to do it, you might as well be the yeah. best one to ever do it. Yeah. So I think it was a combo of his health issues, his age, knowing he was never going to get out of prison, and then this other guy getting a whole bunch of media coverage. I think it was just like the perfect storm. When James Holland started interviewing him, I think Samuel just decided now is time. So he admitted that he specifically chose his victims because of their circumstances. He thought that these women would not be missed, either because of their line of work or their addiction or whatever their family struggles were at the time. Like there was a reason he chose his victims the way that well, he and, did. and the really bad part is he was right you know he chose a part of society that was forgotten about and honestly looked down upon sex workers drug users you know they're kind of like eh. and they're usually estranged from their families a lot of the time and people aren't constantly checking in on them and st- that's the thing is that people care about them it just takes longer for them to report them missing and by the time they do samuel little's long gone he's in the next city exactly yeah i think that's the problem is that he was right i don't think he was an evil genius who just got away with all these things i think he found a niche of people that were kind of forgotten about or not cared as much about by authorities really right or the media yeah exactly so he confessed to james holland the texas ranger about about the murder of Denise Christie Brothers in Texas, which was the one that James Holland originally had gone there to interview him about. And then he just didn't stop. And he started confessing to more and more and more. He confessed to four more in Ohio. And he was convicted of the Texas murder, all four in Ohio, and one in Louisiana. So I'm going to rip to now. Um, three in L.A., one in Texas, four in Ohio. So we're at eight and one in Louisiana. So nine. Now Little was talking and confessing to all these murders, but the biggest problem was they stretched, according to him, all the way back to 1970, and he couldn't remember a lot of names. He was really great with places, but bad at dates and names. So he could describe the scene and the women in, like, excruciating detail. Well, and that's how police are able to kind of verify that he probably was the one that did these things was because he gave him details that hadn't been released to the public or things that nobody else knew. So, you know, it, it would be very hard to just kind of guess at that kind of stuff. Right. So he gave them over 650 hours of videotaped confessions over the next two years. They even brought him to Texas so that they could try him for the Christie brothers murder. And while he was there, they held him at a facility near James Holland's office so that James could just keep Keep interviewing him. The authorities started matching his confessions to unsolved cases all around the country. Pretty quickly, they realized that this guy was not like Henry Lee Lucasing them. He wasn't just confessing to shit he didn't do. His confessions, like you said, had details that only the killer would know. And with a lot of work, the FBI and the local authorities all over the country were able to confirm over 60 murders 
out of the 93 that he confessed to. That's crazy. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, they brought in investigators from all over the country to interview him, and Holland would, like, help them. He would, like, give them tips and pointers on how to get more information out of Samuel. And they even tried to trick him and ask him about ones that they knew he didn't do, like when he was in prison and stuff like that. And he didn't fall for it. He's like, I don't know. I don't recognize that girl. I was never there. Like That's what's nuts, too, is like they were trying to feed him more to kind of see if he's lying. And he's like, no, I didn't do that one. But I did do (laughs) these other ones. Right. Which is why they believed him, because they couldn't he, he never lied to them. Like as far as they could prove, he's never lied. All the details that he's given them have either panned out and been proven or they just haven't been able to prove it yet. But they haven't been able to disprove any of them. So the detail that he's able to recall is what makes them confident he's telling the truth. Like one of the cases he even described taking the victim out to dinner before he murdered her. And he remembered what she ate for dinner. And when they looked back at her autopsy results, the stomach contents from her autopsy were exactly what he said she ate for dinner. Oh, that's... There is no way anybody could know that. That's gnarly. Like, that's so crazy that he remembers that kind of detail, too. Like, that's kind of just something in passing. You'd be like, I guess she was eating a sandwich. But, you know, he knew to the letter what it was. Yes. He remembered such weirdly specific details about each victim that it's kind of unusual that he doesn't remember their names. And even if he does remember their names, a lot of times they weren't even going by their real names because of their line of work. So matching these confessions to these cases is not as easy as it sounds because some of these murders were committed in the 70s and 80s and in some of the cases bodies have never even been found. And then in some cases they've been found but they weren't even ruled a homicide. You know it was ruled a drug overdose or an accidental death or unknown or or the victims are Jane Doe's. They don't even know who the victims are. There's been quite a few where he's admitted to the murder. They've taken the confession. They've gone to that jurisdiction. They found a murder victim that matches and everything matches they know samuel little killed her and they don't even know who she is she's a jane doe nuts yeah totally so another issue is that samuel remembers a lot about each of his victims but his time frames are way off sometimes he would say it was 1980 and when they finally would find something that is linked to that confession like the one with the dinner and the exact autopsy results it was like 10 years off from when he thought. So he maybe said 1980 and it was actually 70 or 90. Yeah. His time frames are way off. But I mean, again, the, the things that he knows are so detailed. I can understand the time frames yeah. being off because eventually these, uh, unfortunately, it's really sick to say, eventually they all kind of blend together. Yeah. Well, and he was living a transient lifestyle. So it's not like he's like, oh, yeah, I worked in... Louisville at a factory from 71 to 74 so it had to have been in those years it's like this guy doesn't work he doesn't have (laughs) have, he doesn't keep a calendar that's a good point he's not going to regular (laughs) engagements I didn't think about that but like he doesn't yeah he's got nothing to time frame it I didn't think about that yeah, like I in some of the FBI tapes that have been released that you can listen to, he does try to narrow it down by the type of car he was driving at the time. He'll be like, oh, I know I was driving this car when I killed this victim. But then he doesn't even remember when he was driving that car. He's like, I don't know, like maybe <laughs> 70s. It's like, oh, my gosh. Well, he wasn't Ridiculous. registering it, so he didn't have to know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exact. It's like, Samuel, if you would have filed paperwork anywhere for anything, this would be a lot easier to figure this out. Yeah. Like, if he had car insurance, we could at least know what kind of cars he was driving <laughs> in what years. But no, of course not. Th- so you could see how hard this is for James Holland to match these victims because Samuel would say stuff like oh this was in Miami just say and just like LA Miami may have 20 different jurisdictions yeah so they have to contact all these places in Miami all these different corners and morgues and all this stuff and be like do you have a victim in this 20 year time gap that matches this description and they're like how the fuck do we know they don't know that's in storage somewhere they have no idea you know so it t- it takes a lot of work to track this stuff down and so Samuel, aside from being a prize fighter, also <laughs> fancied himself an artist. So James Holland decided to use that to get Samuel to draw portraits of his victims. I'd say he was more of an artist than he was a prize fighter, probably. I will say that his portraits are better 
than I could draw. But they're not great either. They're far from. But they're not great. Yeah. Yes. They're far from like portraits. They're kind of like. Right. I was like, portraits is kind of a stretch. Yeah. You know, like when you're in like, I don't know, third or fourth grade and they say draw yourself. That's kind of what they look like. Yes. Now, he didn't draw all of the victims, but he did draw a significant amount of them. And they are all listed on the FBI's website. They have like a whole page dedicated to Samuel Little and his victims, and especially the unidentified ones, because there are still 49 unmatched confessions listed on the FBI's website. And they believe that he did those. Like, it's not yes. that they're like, uh, we don't think they just haven't been able to prove them yet. Yes, because eight of those unmatched confessions have been matched to Jane Doe's. So 41 still need to be matched to a missing person or a body, but eight have already been matched to a body, but those Jane Doe's still need to be identified. So there's like a lot of stuff going on in this case still. Yeah. So like you said, these drawings are not good, but in some weird way, they can be pretty accurate. Like the ones that have been identified based on his drawings, when you see a picture of the person next to the drawing, you're like, oh my gosh, he got the neck perfect, you know, or he got the mouth perfect or the eyes or like there's something that's right in every one of them. Like the drawing as a whole looks like shit, but there's something that's <laughs> accurate in every single one of them. Like it's it's really interesting. Well, and then he emphasized parts of like the body that he remembered too, like whether it was the nose or the neck or the hair. Like usually it was the neck because that's right, what he of was course. obsessed with. Yes. Right, but but the things that he remembered the most he would really emphasize and give a lot more detail to. Yeah, so these drawings are like somewhat accurate, but there's a lot of work to be done still in identifying identifying these women but like we said there's something accurate in each one of these drawings so when family members of these victims see these drawings they're like oh my gosh that's my aunt or that's my mom or that's my sister like people have recognized victims because of these drawings and they've been then they can narrow it down which is surprising because again they're not that great but they're no. good enough yep so you could still listen to a lot of his confessions on the FBI website or on YouTube or wherever, because the FBI has released some of the 650 hours of tape confessions that they have of him. How many hours have you actually watched? Uh, well, they haven't released all 650. I've watched all the hours that they have released. I don't I didn't count it. <laughs> Well, it's hard to not watch. Once you start watching them, you're like, well, what, then what? Then what happened? It's also, honestly, it's really chilling to watch him, too, because the way he talks about him, he calls him his friends and, you know, he just, oh, yeah. they're part of him in a, in a way, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it's just, it's really, it's uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. Like when they ask him, like, did you hate these women? Were you mad at them? He's like, no, I love them. They're my babies. They're my friends. It's like, what? That's kind of exactly it. Yeah, like, they're all kind of, like, he has a connection to all of them in a, in a really strange, weird way. And he says that strangling them is, like, his form of sex. Yeah. Like, that's his version of intimacy or sex or whatever, like, was killing these. It's like, oh, that's something got crossed there, I think. There's a wire loose. Yeah, there's something not quite right in that head. Mm -hmm. But like you said, a lot of people think Samuel Little was like this like incredible genius, prolific serial killer because he had 93 victims, but he was just moving. Before we started this, when I was like, when we I knew about him but didn't really do a lot of research into him, uh -huh. that's exactly how I thought. Yeah. I was like, this guy has to be some kind of like evil, mean, you know, nasty genius type. And nope. And really he wasn't. He just got fucking lucky all the time. He got really lucky. But again, he was right. He picked on people on the fringe of society yeah. that didn't have a lot of representation. Yep. And he got away with it for a really long time. And unfortunately, a lot of people fell you know, victim to him. Yep. So Samuel Little ended up dying December 30th, 2020 in prison at age 80 of natural causes. Like he had diabetes and health, heart problems and all kinds of stuff. That's pretty much why he started confessing because he knew he was on his way out. Yeah. That's the banana story of Samuel Little and how he got away with murdering 93 women over 40 something years. And it would have been more. I mean, obviously there were people who got away and stuff. So 93 is what he remembers. Could there have been a handful? full of others absolutely but there were people who got away so really truly his victim count is 
unknown. Well over a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Well, unknown is is accurate. Yeah, but I was going to say well yeah. over a hundred because people got away from it mm-hmm. too. So yeah. Well, and that's what the FBI thinks. Even on the forty nine unmatched confessions that they need to find matches for, they think that maybe some of them survived like Lori Barros did in San Diego. And they just never reported it, or they did report it, and the report got lost over the years or whatever. Like, Yeah, and just haven't come forward. Right. They they think that maybe some of those women aren't all dead. Like, maybe some women survived. And probably some of them didn't realize who it was. They got away from a, a situation and just kind of like, oh, that's over with. They didn't have the opportunity to show up drunk in court. <laughs> yep. So... At this point, 41 still need to be matched to missing persons or bodies. And those eight Jane Does need to be identified still. That's so insane. And something, too, that we didn't really talk about was part of what he was doing. His girlfriend, Jean Dorsey, she knew what was going on. And she would even clean the car for him. She never really asked questions, yeah. but she would clean the car for him. And again, so she had to have an idea that something nefarious was happening, even if, you know, she didn't know the specific details, mm-hmm. which you wondered too. Like she was able to lie in court and say like, oh no, he's a great guy. She knew he wasn't a great guy. She met him in prison. And then they created this life of just crime right. together. So who knows what Jean actually knew, but she was a much bigger part than just, oh, they traveled around together. Yeah. She she helped too, you know, because basically they would do stuff during the day. He would go out at night and do these things. The next morning while he was sleeping, she would clean the car out and kind of get ready for the next yep. day. But there has never been any proof that she knew he was murdering women or that she was involved in it. But like you said, there's been reports from people who've known them and traveled with them and stuff that she just didn't ask. But I would imagine that Samuel Little was probably... Probably not that great to her either. Yeah. You know, I've kind of thought about that and I I do kind of tend to agree. I don't think he was probably the nicest to her. But again, it was a survival thing and she probably wasn't used to partners being very nice to her. Totally. I could just imagine, like I've seen Samuel Little and how huge his hands are and how big he is and stuff. It's like, I probably wouldn't ask a lot of questions either. I'd be like, you know what? We didn't talk about his hands, but his hands were so big. Like they say that if somebody was to be born a strangler, he would have had the hands to be perfectly born as a strangler. So, I mean, again, this is all kind of the perfect storm for him, too. You know what else big hands are perfect for, too? Um, Prize fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thunder and lightning. Yep. Anyway. I'm glad we did that one. Obviously, you know, I love just the stories of serial killers and stuff. And so I'm really happy that we dove into this one. I'm glad that this was the first one that we chose for season three, episode one. I'm glad we got that one off of our plates because we've been talking about this one since before we started the podcast, so. Yeah, it was a good one for us to get our groove back for season three. Yep, just call us Stella. Stella. Oh. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, how Stella got her it. groove back. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> God, sometimes. <laughs> hey, they're corny, but they're good. Are they, though? Are they good, though? In my opinion. Yeah, okay. Allegedly? <laughs> yeah, allegedly, in my own, according to my own words. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap this up. Hey, guys, come visit us on TikTok. And our Instagram, at From Crime to Crime. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on TikTok. We're on Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. Come find us. We'll be there. Also, we're going to be very soon at CrimeCon. So if you're at CrimeCon, let us know. We would love to hang out and meet guys. Meet meet guys. We would love to hang out and meet some (laughs) of you guys. Grant would love to meet guys. I only want to meet guys. That's it. <laughs> if you're a lady, stay away. I'm married. <laughs> All right. You can also shoot us an email at from crime to crime podcast at gmail.com. And one of us, most likely me, will respond to you as soon as we can. <laughs> and don't forget to change your Amazon smile charity to DNA Doe Project. Yeah, I still got to do that. Well, we'll see you next time. All right. Love you. <laughs> love you too. Bye. Bye.